Good afternoon, everybody. Since Rudolph has given me such a nice introduction, um, I am just going to jump right into the talk itself. So before we do anything else, we need to cover some basics and a little background information. We can start with what giant resonances actually are. So simply, they are the collective movements of the neutron and protons in a nucleus, and they are classed according to the particular way in which they move relative to one another. From a microscopic point of view, they are simple, collective, one particle, one whole excitations, and they are categorized according to their angular momentum transfer, L, spin excitation, S, and isospin excitation, T. The value of the spin excitation classes the resonances as either electric modes of excitation or magnetic modes of excitation. For illustrative purposes, here are the electric modes of excitation. These images illustrate the motion of the neutrons relative to the protons for each electric mode. So what you can see is we have the isoscalar modes here on the left, and they are those in which the protons and neutrons oscillate in phase. So they are modes without isospin excitation. The isovector modes are those in which the protons and neutrons oscillate out of phase. And so we say they are the modes associated with isospin excitation. So just to note that here, the mode with delta T equals zero and delta L equals one has been included for completeness sake, but it's not actually considered to be an intrinsic excitation of the nucleus, since what it is, is essentially an oscillation of the entire nucleus as a whole. Now, giant resonance studies at Etemba Labs focus on the isoscalar giant monopole resonance, also known as the breathing mode, where the nucleus expands and contracts radially and so um, its basic form is maintained, but its volume changes. Then there's the isovector giant dipole resonance, which I'll talk more about in a minute, and the isoscalar giant quadrupole resonance. There are several techniques that can be used to study the giant resonances. These include photoabsorption, radiative capture, decay experiments, inelastic electron scattering and inelastic hadron scattering. So one thing that we do need to talk about is that giant resonances of different polarities are often not energetically well separated. So what I mean when I say that an example of such is that the isoscalar giant quadrupole resonance is located very close to the isovector giant dipole resonance. This presents a distinct challenge in the study of these giant resonances and particularly in the analysis of the experimentally obtained data. To deal with this challenge, um, we have to choose an appropriate reaction. So this figure here um, shows the angular distribution of various multiples for the lead 208 PP prime reaction at 200 MeV. So what you can see in this figure is that the choice of scattering angle determines the multiple that is predominantly excited. So for example, if you look here around zero degrees, you're, you're way more likely to excite the L equals one mode than you are to excite the L equals two mode, for example. But closer to 10 degrees, you're way more likely to excite the L equals two mode than you are to excite the L equals one mode. Another thing that we have to remember and factor into our decisions when we study these giant resonances is that the probe that we use as well as its incident energy are also important. So for example, the best tool to use when studying the isoscalar giant resonances is inelastic scattering of alpha particles at beam energies of 100 to 250 MeV. 
This is because the isoscalar nature of alpha particles means that isoscalar resonances are predominantly excited. Now that we have gone over some of the more general concepts, I'd like to focus our attention on the isovector giant dipole resonance. To remind you, it is the collective excitation of the nucleus where the protons and the neutrons vibrate on mass against one another. So this is the picture that we're looking at. It is excited by a variety of methods, including the use of real photons, virtual photons through relativistic Coulomb excitation, as well as radiative capture. We also need to acknowledge why information on this resonance is important and why we'd like to study it as much as we do. The behavior of the isovector giant dipole resonance provides information on the symmetry energy of nuclear matter, which has applications for the nuclear equation of state in neutron stars. We also know that the location and strength of the isovector giant dipole resonance are crucial in determining nuclear synthesis in the S, R, and P processes. Another thing is that data on photoabsorption cross sections are used in the design of nuclear reactors, neutron shielding, radioisotope production from electron accelerators, and radiation therapy. So from this list, that I've given you now, it should be clear that accurate photoabsorption data are critical for the entire nuclear data community. In fact, there's actually um, an ongoing project led by the International Atomic Energy Agency to generate a new database for strength functions and to update existing photonuclear data because of the importance of this information. While focusing on the isovector giant dipole resonance, I'd like to focus on two different aspects, the broad, the broad structure perspectives and the fine structure perspectives. I really love this picture when I first saw it because it illustrates these concepts very nicely. So here you can see two very nice giant resonance like mountains. And what we are looking at now in this first part of the talk is the overall shape of the mountains and the forests that cover them. In the early 1950s, the discovery was made that some nuclei are deformed in their ground states. The nuclear shapes that we need to consider are the spherical nucleus, which I have chosen to represent by these pool balls. We also have a prolate ellipsoid which you can think of as a rugby ball shape, and an oblate ellipsoid, which you can think of as your typical smarty shape. Now, research in this area has largely focused mostly on the rare earth and actinide regions, since a large number of deformed nuclei are located near or on the line of beta stability in these regions. Because of, the, because of this, these nuclei are easily accessible experimentally. When studying the isovector giant dipole resonance, we also need to know what to expect when it comes to the effect of this deformation of the nucleus on the resonance that we see. So we know that what we should expect is an energy just distribution that is strongly dependent on the nucleus shape. So for a spherical nucleus, we expect a narrow, single peaked resonance. For a prolate ellipsoid or oblate ellipsoid, we expect an overall broadening of the resonance and the eventual splitting of the resonance, which leads to this double peaked shape. Now, the splitting, which we call K splitting, is caused by the fact that the vibrations in the nucleus now occur um, for different length axes than they did in the spherical case. In the rugby ball, you have a vibration along a longer axis, as well as vibrations along the other two shorter axes. This means that the energies are now a little different and leads to different K components. So for the rugby ball case, which is what we're focusing on today, 
you have a k equals zero component here on the lower side and a k equals one component here on the upper side. Two good examples of this evolution of the shape of the isovector giant dipole resonance with deformation are the neodymium and samarium isotope chains. This figure separates both the neodymium and samarium isotope chains into four regions. So we have the quasi-spherical region, the intermediate spherical slash deformed region, where the nucleus is treated as being spherical on average, but with a small deformation, or as having a very small permanent deformation. We also then have the transitional region and the deformed region. Now the transitional region is particularly interesting since this region comprises nuclei that alter the properties of nuclear surfaces dramatically. So where the neutron number varies from 88 to 92, there is essentially a phase transition from a spherical vibrator to an axial rotor. And we can see this when we look at the ratio of the energy of the four plus state to the energy of the two plus state. And we see that it increases sharply when you go from 148 neodymium to 150 neodymium and 150 samarium to 152 samarium. And this change in this ratio is indicative of the transition that I just mentioned. Now, both um, the neodymium and samarium isotope chains have been studied using photoabsorption experiments at Sackley and using relativistic Coulomb excitation at Etemba Labs. We can now take a look at the individual results and ultimately compare them. So this is what was seen with the photoabsorption studies. The total photoabsorption cross sections showed that for the spherical 142 neodymium, 144 neodymium and 144 samarium, the isovector giant dipole resonance is single peaked and very narrow. For the deformed cases, which are the 150 neodymium, 152 samarium, and 154 samarium, the isovector giant dipole resonance is double peaked and very broad. And between these extremes, we have the overall broadening of the resonance as we go from spherical to deformed. Now, before we move on to the details of the Atemba Labs measurements, we should take a look at what I mean when I talk about relativistic Coulomb excitation. So this is the scenario that we're ultimately working with. A projectile approaches the system with an energy of say 200 MeV. It then passes very, very close to the target nucleus. And in this interaction, an exchange of virtual photons occurs. Because of this exchange, the projectile no longer has the same energy that it arrived with. And this changed projectile then moves on to the detection system, the detection system, excuse me, and, um, and it will be detected and will tell us more about what happened in the actual reaction. So, for example, when I talk about a PP prime reaction, you would have the proton P come into the system and it would leave as P prime. So it's changed and is then detected. <clears throat> so now Coulomb excitation um, experiments at Etemba Labs specifically. So here you can see a layout of Etemba Labs, which shows the existing facility here. The other sections shown are those that will form part of the South African isotope facility. Now, the beam is generated at the iron source and moves through to the separated sector cyclotron, where it's accelerated. At this facility, we can get energies up to 200 MeV. After the SSC, the beam is directed through the beam line using a series of magnets, and eventually it finds its way to the K600 volt, 
where we have a spectrometer that is perfect for these relativistic proof and excitation measurements. On that note, let's focus in on the K600 magnetic spectrometer itself. Here in this figure, you can see a schematic drawing of the spectrometer, which is comprised of a quadrupole, two dipole magnets, and each of the magnets have a K and H coil. So um, in this particular image, it is positioned at zero degrees. And um, what's important about this facility is that it is currently one of two facilities in the world that is capable of high energy resolution measurements at zero degrees with low background compared to the measured spectrum for medium energy light ions. Another thing that is great about this facility is that the spectrometer can also be coupled to a gamma ray detector array, which can include high purity germanium detectors, lanthanum bromide detector detectors, or a combination of both. It can also be um, coupled to a silicon detector array. So we can do some really nice coincidence measurements at these Hember labs. For the neodymium and samarium isotope chains, uh, the measurements that we did on them, um, we decided to use 200 MeV inelastic proton scattering using the K600 magnetic spectrometer positioned at zero degrees. So under these kinematic conditions, our Coulomb excitation dominates, which is what we want. We also chose to use self-supporting neodymium and samarium targets with aerial densities between 1.8 and 2.6 milligrams per centimeter squared. So all of these factors taken into consideration and the lovely piece of equipment that we use, we're able to obtain very good energy resolution, which is something I'd like you to keep in mind for a little bit later in the talk. Here in this figure, I'm just showing you the double differential cross sections that are obtained following some basic analysis procedures. I didn't show these steps in the interest of time, um, but there are papers that include more details on um, the data extraction process. And if you're interested, I'm happy to provide those for you. So here in this overview of double differential cross sections, what we can see is uh, the appearance of some fine structure, which we're able to see because we have typical energy resolutions of um, about 35 keV full width half maximum. And again, this is very important for later. So just keep that in the back of your mind. And we also see that we have a broad structure between 12 MeV and 18 MeV which corresponds to the excitation of the isovector giant dipole resonance. We see that the width of this resonance increases steadily from the nearly spherical 144 neodymium through to the more deformed 150 neodymium and its isotone 152 samarium. Now, I told you that we would be able to compare the results from the two different types of experiments, but this isn't possible with the data being as they stand. Um, we need to do some conversion so that we are ultimately comparing apples with apples. And um, to obtain an equivalent um, photoabsorption cross-section from our inelastic uh, proton scattering data, we need to apply what we call the equivalent virtual photon method. Now, this method basically hinges on this um, equation that I've provided here, where your double differential cross section is given as a function of the photoabsorption cross section. So, if we now do a little bit of rearranging and we isolate the photoabsorption cross section term, we can get it in terms of our double differential cross section, the excitation energy, and the virtual photon production function. If you're interested in this method and all of the theory behind it, there is a lot more information in these references that I have listed here. 
This figure just provides you with an overview of this conversion process that um, I just mentioned. So the process can be divided into three distinct stages. So we start here at um, panel A of this figure where you can see the double differential cross section for the inelastic proton scattering on 150 neodymium at 200 MeV. Um, the first step is background subtraction in the region of the isovector giant dipole resonance. Now, when I say that, I'm not referring to subtraction of instrumental background or anything like that. What I'm referring to is what we actually discussed earlier, um, where the particular resonance that you're interested in may not be the only one that is excited in the particular reaction that you have selected. So in this case, we actually have um, some excitation of the isoscalar giant quadrupole resonance, the isoscalar scalar giant monopole resonance, and we need to take into account the phenomenological background. So we need to um, extract just the eyes of extra giant dipole resonance strength when we go forward with this conversion. So to do that, we subtract the contribution from other multiples, and we're left with just the giant dipole resonance strength. The second step in the process is the calculation of the virtual photon spectrum, which I have put here. And the third step is um, implementing the equation that we discussed on the previous slide, where we take this um, data divided by the virtual photon spectra spectrum, multiply it by the energy, and we're left with the equivalent photo absorption cross-section. So this procedure has been tested for several cases. If I name a few, um, it would be uh, calcium 48, 10, 120, and lead 208. And in all of these cases, fair agreement has been found. To convince you of this, here is a test case comparison for data taken at the Research Center for um, Nuclear Physics in Japan. And you can see that the um, inelastic proton scattering data taken at RCNP is compared with the existing um, real photoabsorption data. And from both the upper and lower figure, we can see that there's excellent agreement um, between the two measurements, um, especially in the lower panel um, with respect to the shape of the resonance itself. Now, for the test case comparisons that were performed at eTember Labs, um, the overall shape of the results from the PP prime equivalent photoabsorption data are consistent with previous previously published data. Um, it should be noticed, it should be noted though, that um, the absolute cross sections do have uncertainties when you look at the Atemba Labs results. And this is because the present setup at zero degrees does not allow for the determination of accurate vertical scattering information. And so the angular resolution is limited. But having said that, I do need to state that the distribution of the resonance with respect to the excitation energy axis is not affected at all by this. You are able to make um, very accurate statements with regard to the overall shape. The only thing that is really um, affected would be the overall strength of the resonance up or down on the y-axis, but the shape is completely fine. So in this case, the shape comparisons were achieved using a normalization factor of 0 0.6 plus minus 0 0.1 um, for all of the, the targets. And this normalization factor is consistent with uh, measurements on other isotopes uh, but using the same setup. 
Moving on to um, the comparison of the neodymium and samarium results with the um, existing photo absorption results. Here I've displayed the Attempt Labs results in red and the previous photo absorption results obtained by Carlos et al. in green. So if you look at the comparison from spherical to deformed, both show a general broadening with the deformation. For the 150 ne neodymium and 152 samarium, we see this pronounced asymmetry in the resonance, but we do not observe this like distinct split that was seen in the photoabsorption data. We also should note that we observe in the spherical and transitional nuclei a shift of the centroid to slightly higher energies. Now, what we also did was we chose to make some theoretical comparisons as well. So the SCOM separable random phase approximation calculations, um, which use the assumption of well-defined deformation, were used for this comparison. And what you can see for the 150 neodymium and 152 samarium, the k equals zero components of the theoretical predictions do lie above our data but they are still well below the Carlos et al. data. So there's just general disagreement and it would be interesting to know why. In terms of what other groups have been seeing, if you take a look at these uh, references and these figures that I've provided here, new photoneutron experiments have found that uh, systematically um, have found systematically smaller photoabsorption cross sections in the region between the neutron threshold and approximately 13 MeV. For the stable samarium isotope chain, the photoneutron cross sections were 20 to 30, 37% lower than those obtained by Carlos et al. And for the light neodymium isotopes, cross sections were 20 to 30% lower than Carlos et al. Here we have a comparison um, in terms of data for the 154 samarium case. And um, this is comparing the equivalent photoabsorption cross sections obtained at RCMP. So they use the same method of um, relativistic Coulomb excitation with inelastic proton scattering. And that data is shown in red. Um, and the data of Carlos et al. is shown in green. So similar to the 150 neodymium and 152 samarium results from Itemba Labs, we see a different um, k equals zero to k equals one ratio. And what they observed is a clear decrease in the k equals zero region and a very slight increase in the k equals one region, which is qualitatively what we observed in our data at Etemba Labs. Maybe ours is a little bit more exaggerated, but qualitatively the, the pattern is the same. Now, when it comes to a possible cause of the discrepancies, we need to consider what we're actually measuring in the two different method, methods. So when we consider an experiment where real photons are used as opposed to virtual photons, the real cross sections are measured. So this cross section is obtained through measurement of all of the important partial cross sections. So here you can see the total um, photoabsorption cross section is, has um, contributions from various terms and each of these would need to be measured individually. Remember that this is not the case for virtual, for, for virtual photons. When we use relativistic Coulomb excitation, we have one inclusive measurement. So we do not have to rely on looking at certain channels. Now, the general thinking when it comes to determining the photoabsorption um, cross-section is as follows. The gamma gamma prime contribution is considered to be low because the resonance that we are interested in lies well above the particle emission threshold. 
So they generally neglect this term. The gamma P term is also generally neglected in medium and heavy mass nuclei because significant charged particle decay should be prevented by the Coulomb barrier. So that term is generally removed as well. So what's left is that basically the total photoabsorption cross-section is obtained by measuring the neutron yield as a function of gamma energy. There are two different techniques that can be used to do this. Either the detection of the outgoing neutrons produced in the gamma XN reactions, or by observation of the decay of the unstable nucleus resulting from the photoactivation of the target sample. The second technique is very powerful, but a drawback is that it is only possible in cases where the final nucleus is unstable and has a clear and detectable decay transition. The neutron detection technique is sensitive to neutron background and detectors and the neutron energy distribution for computing reactions. We also have that the neutron multiplicity sorting of the data can lead to some problems with the normalization results. So if, if we get any transfer of events from the 2N side to the 1N side, for example, the normalization of the results is gonna be out. So our hypothesis in one neat, one sentence um, situation is that we believe that there may be problems with how the 1N and 2N events are processed in the real photon data. So if you'd like to read a little bit more on this hypothesis and on what else has been found, you can see this re these references by Volimov et al. It's a very interesting, it's a very interesting read. So now how do we actually investigate this further? We have all these discrepancies, but what do we do about them? So what would be, what would be good is if we could have a reference case that will allow for a comparison between the virtual photon method performed at ETEMBA labs and the real photon measurements obtained at Sackley and Livermore that excludes possible effects from differing neutron multiplicities. With that, we would also like a measurement of a reference case that explicitly includes reactions with different neutron multiplicities. And because of these two ideals, we um, believe that a measurement of zirconium-90 and terbium-159 using the inelastic scattering of 200 MeV protons at zero degrees in conjunction with the K600 magnetic spectrometer would be highly beneficial. Now, why do I say this? Why zirconium-90? In zirconium-90, the two neutron threshold lies at high excitation energy well above the main peak of the isovector giant dipole resonance. And the gamma P cross-section in this case is thought to be weak in the peak of the isovector giant dipole resonance. So this allows for the comparison of the shape of the isovector giant dipole resonance determined from the Etemba Labs experiment with that determined from the gamma 1N photoneutron data without the inclusion of any confounding neutron multiplicity effects. As a result, a relatively simple direct comparison can be made between the distribution of the isovector giant dipole resonance determined um, from the Atemba Labs results and that from the measured gamma 1N cross-section. Another advantage with this case is that multiple data sets exist. We have data from Livermore, Sackley, and Higgs, but there are also virtual photon data available from RCNP. So that would allow us to really compare um, apples with apples and be able to compare the data taken using the same method, but at different labs. Now, if we look at these figures that I have included here, 
the upper figure shows the comparison of the experimental cross sections obtained um, for zirconium 90 at Livermore in blue and at Sackley in black. And now, as you can see, um, here is the two neutron threshold. And so we can see that really the main part of the isovector giant dipole resonance falls below this threshold. And so it's, it's therefore dominated by this single nucleon emission. So we'd really be looking at gamma 1n, um, the gamma 1n reaction. The lower figure shows the zirconium 90 measurement taken at Higgs. And as you can see, their data also differs from Sackley and Livermore. So we really need to know what's going on because there seem to be a lot of discrepancies floating around here. Now, the possible impact of the neutron multiplicity can be investigated using the terbium-159. In this case, the isovector giant dipole resonance is predicted to have a bimodal distribution, which spans the two neutron threshold. So if we take a look at this figure, here is the two neutron threshold, and you can see that part of the resonance lies to the left, and part of the resonance lies to the right. This nucleus is strongly deformed, and so significant splitting has been observed. And um, it would be similar to what we would find for Samarium 154. But in this case, um, the additional advantage is that there are more real photon data available from Livermore, Sackley, and now also we have data from the Phoenix collaboration. Now, we would expect that if the processing of the photoneutron data from Sackley does in fact cause a transfer of events from the gamma 2n to the gamma 1n channel, then what we should see is a similar effect to what we saw for the neodymium and samarium data taken at Etamba Labs. So this investigation will allow us to verify that the differences that we've observed between the photoabsorption data and the K600 data are actually due to the multiplicity sorting problem. Just to summarize our broad structure perspectives, what we have seen is that there are systematic effects relating to neutron detection that are present in isovector giant dipole resonance photoneutron data from Livermore and Sackley. We also have the fact that discrepancies related to the distribution of strength of the resonance have been observed between the equivalent photoabsorption spectra obtained using PP prime data and the corresponding direct photoabsorption measurements at Sackley. So lots of discrepancies. And in order to find out a little bit more about what's going on, we need a reference case that excludes possible effects from differing neutron multiplicities and one that explicitly includes them. And so we propose this measurement of zirconium-90 and terbium-159 using um, relativistic, relativistic Coulomb excitation um, with the K600 magnetic spectrometer at Itemba Labs. And I am very excited to say that the experiment has been scheduled for May this year. Um, or whether that actually goes ahead in the time frame we were expecting um, isn't for certain yet. We're not sure if COVID has any other plans for us, but as things stand, um, it should be going ahead in May of this year. Now, on to our fine structure perspectives and back to our lovely picture of the giant resonance-like mountains. So instead of now looking at the overall shape of the forest covering these resonance, resonances, we would like to look at the individual trees that make up this forest. An important aspect of any giant resonance is its width, which is explained to have three components, 
The first is Landau damping, in which the initial one particle, one hole excitations fragment. The second is the escape width as a result of direct particle emission from the one particle, one hole excitations. And the third is the spreading width, which is the result of coupling to more complex two particle, two hole states, and finally to n particle, n hole states, terminating in a chaos of compound nuclear states. I've included this figure to give you an idea of the importance of high energy resolution. <clears throat> Excuse me. In the past, high resolution was not possible. And what we essentially saw was broad structures that would have widths comparable to gamma two. With high energy resolution, however, we have seen that these broad structures actually have sets of substructure that have their own widths comparable to gamma one. And this is why if you want to look at this fine structure, if you want to look at the trees, the, the individual trees that make up the forest, we really need to have very good energy resolution. And this is one thing that the um, Etamilabs data has over the previous photoabsorption data is the fact that we were able to obtain high energy resolution. This wasn't the case with their data, it wasn't possible. And all they could um, pretty much comment on is the broad structure information. So moving on to the wavelet analysis technique that we need for this investigation. Here we have a sample spectrum that has both broad and finer structures. So these little ups and downs that we see. We start with a mother wavelet shown here that has the characteristic that the area above the curve is equal to the area below the curve. Now the particular scale that we're using um, is, well it corresponds to a particular width. So this, spec this wavelet moves along our spectrum and as it moves along the spectrum it measures the extent of the overlap with the measured spectrum and then produces a coefficient at each excitation energy and it plots it separately. And an example of this coefficient plot that is produced um, will be shown when we apply this method to our neodymium data. Now this process is done for a range of different scales or widths. And here in this example, this larger scale or width corresponds to extremely good overlap with the width of the resonance itself. Now that you know the basic principles of this wavelet analysis technique, we can move on to how we applied it to our measurements of the neodymium isotope chain. Here we have an overview of our measured equivalent photoabsorption spectra. As we discussed earlier, they were obtained by converting our PP prime cross sections. And um, we can see in this overview that a fine structure is definitely present in each of the isotopes. We managed to achieve on average about 35 keV full width half maximum in terms of the energy resolution. And um, each of these spectra, so each isotope was um, wavelet analyzed, but um, because of time, I'm only going to discuss two isotopes. I will, so I'll, I chose one spherical example and one deformed example. In this top figure, we have the experimental excitation energy spectrum um, for, um, for, sorry, 142 neodymium. And um, over here is the coefficient plot that you've all been patiently waiting for. So just to remind you, the um, coefficient is a measure of how well the wavelet overlaps with our measured spectrum for a specific width or scale. So the projected sum of the squares of these coefficients 
gives the power spectrum seen here. Just to note that the dashed lines that we see here just indicate the excitation region from 11 MeV to 20 MeV over which the wavelet coefficients were summed in order to produce this power spectrum. Now, we can apply the same procedure to theoretical calculations and then compare the um, respective power spectra. So these QPM calculations were performed by Vladimir Ponomarev. He provided calculations at the one phonon level, as well as at the one plus two phonon level, where the one phonon states interact with the two phonon configurations. Their corresponding coefficient plots and power spectra are also displayed here, um, along with the spectra. Now, when it comes to the actual comparison, um, this figure allows us to compare the experimental and theoretical results relatively easily. So when it comes to a comparison of the results, what we need to do is identify the energy scales from the peaks and points of inflection in the power spectra. And then what we do is we display them um, as filled circles, and we also plot their associated error bars. So you can see you have a um, maximum here, maximum point of inflection maximum. And for each of those points, you plot your filled circle with the associated error bars. Now, what we also chose to do was to represent the experimental results by these vertical gray bars as well. And we then uh, reproduce these gray bars in each of the panels below um, to make our lives easier when it comes to determining correspondence between the experimental and theoretical results. Um, one thing that I just quickly want to note is that when the scales are within error bars of one another, then we consider them to be in agreement. So if we look on the one phonon level and you look at the prediction, theoretical prediction, um, they have a single dominant doorway state close to the maximum um, of the experimental region. Um, and it is surrounded then by well-spaced weaker states. And so what we would expect and what we see is that we have um, scales that correspond well in the theoretical case to the experimental scales. But one thing that I would like to point out here is that this low energy scale that we see very clearly in the experimental results is not there at all in the one phonon results. You, you can't even see an inkling of a point of inflection or anything there at all. So it's definitely missing um, from these one phonon results. Now on the one plus two phonon level, if you look at the prediction itself, we see that the basic shape of the resonance is predicted, um, where the maxima correlate well with the corresponding maxima in the experimental spectrum. And overall, we see that similar scales to the one phonon results are found um, when looking at the range of several hundred keV with only slight shifts in energy. But now what's pretty cool is we see this low energy scale that we were missing in the one phonon results. Here it is very clear um, and it, it corresponds very nicely to the scale in the experimental results. And um, what this means is that the scale is definitely a result then of coupling to two particle, two hole configurations, which is a really nice result actually. Now we can move on, move on to a deformed case. So here are the results for 150 neodymium, where the calculation used for comparison are the QPM again, but this time assuming a deformed basis. So I'll refer to it as QPM deformed and the SCOM separable random phase approximation, which we know 
assumes well deformed, well um, deformed uh, basis. So in these results, what we can see um, when we look at the predictions, the QPM deformed and SSRPA predictions show a high degree of fragmentation in the lower energy region. And what we also see is that the SSRPA calculations find significantly more strength than the QPM deformed calculations. And the reasons for this, we still need a little bit more investigation into to understand better what's going on there. But with respect to the power spectrum, what we see is a reasonable degree of overlap and number of scales corresponding with the experimental scales. And what these results indicate is that the observed fine structure arises mainly from Landau damping. Um, we can't say this, you know, for 100% certain because we're not actually able to investigate um, to what extent coupling to two particle, two hole configurations actually, um, what role it plays here, because we don't have the theoretical calculations available. Um, so if we did have that, it would be highly beneficial to confirm these results that we have found. Um, but in general, you know, with, uh, with a reasonable degree of certainty, we can say that the observed fine structure arises mainly from Landau damping. If you're interested in the full isotope chain and a full comparison between isotopes, uh, we recently published a comprehensive article in Physical Review C, which can be found um, at this reference that I've provided here, and a, a lot of detail in terms of the experiment itself, the analysis, all of that is found in this paper. So if you're interested, you are welcome to take a look. So just a quick summary of the fine structure perspectives. We have observed fine structure in even the most deformed cases we studied. And this is really quite remarkable if we consider the extreme level densities that we're working with. So we have about 10 to the eight states per MeV at the isovector giant dipole resonance peak energy in 150 neodymium, for example. So these are really extreme level densities. And the fact that we observe this fine structure and can study it is um, really a remarkable result. Now we can use wavelet analysis techniques to quantify the features of the observed fine structure in terms of characteristic scales. With regard to the agreement that we observed, it's mixed. If we neglect tri trivial scales resulting from the energy resolution and those related to the total width of the isovector giant dipole resonance, the number of scales can be approximately reproduced in most cases, but the absolute values vary. And this now needs some further investigation and we are already on, on the track in terms of that. Um, what we can say, however, is that Landau damping seems to be the main source of the fine structure in both spherical and deformed nuclei, and that there is some impact of the spreading due to coupling of the two particle two hole states to the one particle one hole doorway states in spherical nuclei, where uh, such calculations beyond the RPA are actually available. And um, with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and also thank my collaboration for my collaborators for their hard work and um, their involvement in these studies. Thank you very much.